and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. Live. That, that was excellent. <laughs> All right, so uh, for those of you that don't know, the BS and Beer Show is a, a thing that we started doing via Zoom at the beginning of the pandemic uh, because we all used to get together, not all of us, but uh, us Mainers used to get together in person and have a building science discussion group once a month, and we were missing that. So uh, we started a Zoom show, and uh, people started showing up to listen to us talk, which was kind of awkward <laughs> Hard and to weird. believe. Awkward right? and weird for us. Uh, and so we carried it on, and uh, we now have uh, sponsorship from Fine Home Building and Green Building Advisor. We don't get any money. We do this totally pro bono uh, to help the community. Wait, you're, they not, just get, help you're not getting paid? What? We oh, didn't said that was fat I wondered why they were giving you those envelopes and trying to hide it from me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Fine Home Building and Green Building Advisor help us make this thing happen from a technical end and make sure that Zoom works because we all have day jobs and uh, struggle to open our emails sometimes. So <laughs> It's very complicated. So what are we talking about? Control dominance. <laughs> Wait, do you want to do introductions? Like, I like our normal show structure. Uh, yeah, we have a system. We have Mike a system. Mains true. laid out a brilliant right. system, and if we just follow Mike's directions, everything goes off swimmingly. We introduce the show. Oh, yeah. We thank our sponsors. We introduce each other. We introduce our guests. We talk about what we're drinking. All right, so let's it's do a it. tried and true right. formula. Who are you? Oh, hi, I'm Travis Brungart. Uh, I'm with Catalyst Construction in Prairie Village, Kansas. Tonight, I'm drinking a Budweiser, the king of beers. <laughs> And now I'd like to introduce my friend and, uh, and, and co-host, Emily. Say hello. Hi, I'm Emily Montrum. I'm usually the technical person. If anything goes wrong this time, it's not my fault. I'm an architect in Maine, and I am drinking Retro Tech, so you can guess what I am drinking tonight. <laughs> Mystery beer. Beers. Mystery beer. Ben, did you introduce yourself? I didn't. So I'm Ben Bogey. Uh, I'm a project manager and uh, general bearded weirdo from Connecticut. Uh, I obsess about <laughs> things at night relating to the built environment that keep me up for hours because I have no hobbies. Wow. So and you are, that was dark, man. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I'm Michael Anschel. I uh, own OA Design Build in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We've been at this for about 27 years. We do kind of fun stuff. And I'm uh, embarrassed. I'm not going to say what I'm drinking. But it, it's almost beer. Oh. And I'm Carl Seville with SK Collaborative in Decatur, Georgia. I am a recovered contractor. I now do green building certification for multifamily and single family developers all over the country. And I also write occasionally as the green building curmudgeon on Green Building Advisor. Carl is much more qualified than any of us here, and we brought him along as the ringer. <laughs> Except for typically when we have these two on, uh, we do something ridiculous. And so, and we usually also have our fearless leader, Mike Maines, who is on the front here, who could not join us at the show. And so if you have any questions, uh, tag Mike Maines online and write hashtag Mike and he can answer them. Mike. He's probably the only one who knows, so it's for the best. So what are we talking about, Travis? So today we'd like to talk about the four control layers. And by bringing in the green police for this, I think we should maybe let one of them introduce a layer and well, then we talk should, about it. We should explain that Carl and I uh, have an alter ego personality as the green police. You may have seen us on YouTube videos talking about products, eating mushroom insulation. Carl murdered me once behind some Roxel because sound insulating Sadly, qualities. it didn't stick. It didn't stick, I'm back. <laughs> Unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> cool, control layers, what? I mean, pinky in the brain. Also, we also sometimes go by pinky in the brain uh, and every day we try to take over uh, control of the world, so control layers seems fitting. Thanks, you guys, for the nice setup. Right. So, pinky, why don't you get us started? Um, I, I am the brain. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any argument in that, Carl. <laughs> so, uh, you'll so, get your check later, Ben. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Four dollars. <laughs> what are the control layers? Well, let's see. We start with thermal. No. Yeah. No. no. Okay. There's air. Sorry. Oh, start with water. It's the most important. And why is it the most important? Well, I didn't, you didn't say we had to do this in some kind yeah, of rank. order. Oh, come, come on, on. I thought they? there was a defined hierarchy here. Oh, I thought we've yeah. all accepted this, that come there's a defined on. hierarchy. Right. Well, no, actually, the water control layer, it depends on the construction. If it's solid masonry construction, the water control layer is much less important. And now you're just getting technical. Okay. If I have to drink every time you say it depends tonight, I'm going to need more beer. <laughs> well, we're going to need more beer. <laughs> we can so make we that. Have, okay. We have water. We have air. We have thermal. vapor, vapor, and thermal. Ooh, the vapor and monster. thermal, and and the fifth control layer, which is of course 
where we lock up all of the controls and everything and we keep the occupant out of the structure. Yeah. Uh, the the yeah. occupant, the mythical occupant control layer. Right. The, the literal worst thing we can do for our buildings after we finish constructing them is to let somebody move into them. Right. Well, Michael, are you still putting locks on the thermostats so your clients can't control them? <laughs> I have been threatening to do that for years. I, I still want to do it, especially the, the, e, the ERV. Because yeah. they think, ah, this is just, well, it's a waste. Why is it beeping for me to change the filters? I'm just going to unplug this thing. <laughs> right. Unplug it, turn it off. Right. Yeah. yeah. I want to have that locked well, up. Well, let, let me, I've, I've been thinking about this control because I'm, I live in the South. I'm from the North, but I live in the South. And what's, what's interesting is that in my climate, thermal control is probably the least important. You know, whereas you people who live in the tundra have a very different different opinion. We, we have it. a different opinion. I mean, on that. Like I always tell people, it's like if if I had to give up something in my climate, I would give up insulation, because the like actually I have a I have a house little house behind my main house that has no insulation in the walls and it's basically comfortable most of the year. If it gets really that, cold, it's yeah. uncomfortable for a few days. But yeah, you know, the, the shack. I mean, you're talking about the, the shack, shack yeah. thing you used to live in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, I didn't insulate the existing walls because it would have destroyed the building. Um, right. So I didn't insulate them, and the building's fine without insulation. You know, not that I would build a new building with that insulation, but I so mean, if we didn't insulate houses, let's do it real. They'd be they'd, they'd never they'd be just fine. They'd last forever. Well, that's yeah. like we, we have know? houses in New England that are three hundred something years old, and it's because yeah. they get wet, right. and then we kiln dry them in the winter, and it dries right. them we, out, and like then that. they get we wet again, dry. and then we kiln dry them again well, in the well, winter. Well, actually, insulation is what destroys buildings, yeah. basically. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 honestly, so. it's the energy people who just have screwed this whole thing yeah, up. Right. I mean, if we didn't care about energy efficiency, nonsense. our buildings would last forever. And that's like, we're not going to run out of energy. I mean, the energy is literally a giant battery. But here's the thing is, so if we skip the insulation, What's the most important one if we skip insulation? Bulk water. I'm going to go to the bulk water. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decide. But that, that's because we have water where we live, and it gets cold, and we all know that cold plus wet so, so is if we not live, so, so awesome. So if we live in the arid southwest and water is not so much of a concern, then what's next? Air, probably. Yeah. And I would say air. Yeah. And I, I, the, one of the things that I commonly tell people is because is they, they're like, oh, we're going to add more insulation. We're going to add more insulation to our house. The, the biggest bang for the buck we can get for performance of the house is just air sealing. Oh, absolutely, yeah. We're going to stop yeah. more comfort issues and more uh, risk to the building by just air sealing. That's why, you know, and I, this isn't to give a plug for AeroSeal, but I, I was a little... Um, AeroSeal, it's awesome. Speculative at first <laughs> about AeroSealing, but like really, like if we could figure out a way to put that into existing structures and AeroSeal existing structures, yeah. like when they change hands via oh, real estate transactions or something great. like that, yeah. we'd do more for our energy usage in this country than we would by stacking insulation all over the place. Oh yeah, yeah. well again, like uh, people always talk about, I'm just gonna add a bunch of insulation in my attic, but if they don't air seal, if they don't take the old crap out and air seal it, it's kind of a waste. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, pretty pointless. Well, there's a durability component to that as well. So your your insulation provides great value for your comfort or your savings on energy. But if you haven't done the critical work of air sealing, then you've introduced a place for that vapor to be harbored as bulk water and turn your OSB sheeting into mulch. And then all of a sudden that wonderful house that you built was beautiful and it's well insulated and it's so comfortable inside, except that you skip that water detail and now you have a structural failure you or at the very least a very <laughs> expensive repair. Yeah. Yeah. What, I've heard somebody call it vertical mulch. Vertical mulch. Yeah. Vertical mulch. Yeah. 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 I like that one. Well, especially when, when they use, when they build houses, what is referred to now as was wood. Uh, was wood. Yeah. 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 You know, Beaver bark. As opposed to wood. It's yeah. like, you know. <laughs> I think that's a Mark LaLiberté line. That's a good line. Yeah. That's that's a good. Who was wood? So <laughs> at the same time, though, that we say air is so important, we have to be careful because up where we are, we have foam guys who will come out and say, it doesn't matter how much you put in there. It's air sealing is all that really matters. So we don't have to, you know, full, you know, hit code minimums. We don't need to put, you know, R50 on the lid. Yeah, you know, R20. It's foam. It's air sealed. It's done. Right. And it doesn't quite work that way. But is it? No, I mean, see, that actually works in our climate. In your climate, yeah. but you don't need insulation in the first right, place. No, we don't need it at all. Well, I think I think the key the th key is what's the temperature differential from inside and out. In the in the summertime, our delta T is probably the same as yours, maybe 20 degrees, kind of in that range, right? You know, about 90, 90ish outside. Except where you live, it gets to 110 in the summertime now. <laughs> 
<laughs> and what does it get to in the winter time? Minus, yeah. minus 31 right. air so, temperature. So, so, you have, yeah. so you have a, so that's, that's you have what, a 100, like a 100 degree, degree you delta degree. You have a 100 degree temperature <laughs> differential in the winter time. <laughs> we have maybe a 30, 40 delta D. Occasionally gets a little bigger than that, but on average it's 30 or 40 degrees. The other day it went, it was like I woke up and I went out, I looked to check the, the, the thermostat. It was like minus 22 or something. And this is around 8 o'clock in the morning. By 11, it was 20 degrees. So the Bombing. swing... <laughs> Just 50 back degrees and forth. in a day. Yeah. 50 degrees easily over a couple of hours. That's a lot. That, that, you're messing with the building quite a yeah. bit. Yeah. Our RH levels spike. They just go all yeah. over the freaking place. Yeah. So can you, like, go out and look at the PVC cladding on the outside of your house and just, like, watch it grow by the hour? It like, doesn't you, work you, like that. sit and just, like, watch the gap open by your window and close? <laughs> <laughs> so... Are we, we are, we're talking about PVC now? Should we talk about yeah, PVC? Sure. Let's talk about <laughs> PVC. <laughs> yeah. What so, an excellent explanation of the control layers. Let's skip to the let's PVC. Let's just go right to PVC. <laughs> it's a lot of BS and just a little bit of building science. Right. <laughs> Come on now. So I was actually, I was always under the impression that PVC, and, and Carl and I used to hate on vinyl. Like, we went, we went to the Vinyl Association because they had salt and we had tequila. We, we, yeah, we drank tequila with the salt that they were giving And that out. was like, that's all they're good for. <laughs> But I've kind of gone 360 on this one, or 180, whatever it would be. 180. <laughs> I'll be right back, the same I'll be right back where I started. It's this Budweiser. Uh, right. <laughs> so when we were working recently with these three-quarter-inch PVC panels, what we learned is that um, in the process of making the panel, there's all of this um, energy that gets bottled up in the panel, and that it goes through this annealing cycle where it contracts and it loses. But kind of like that pendulum thing, it never, um, as it expands again, it never expands to where it was. And then when it contracts, it never contracts to where it was. And after two or three cycles, it stops. And it's just not noticeable anymore. The big expansion contraction that we see is usually on composites that are a mixture of materials. But when we're in pure PVC, it doesn't. So unfortunately, I don't get to watch my house move. However, I will note, it creaks and pops. It's the, so, we sit outside in the summer, and as the sun hits one wall, we'll hear it go pop, pop, creak, creak. And our neighbors, the, f the first summer, came over and said, I think something's wrong with your house, because they could hear it in the, <laughs> like over in their yard. So it is it's moving like, around. It's like that haunted house from like books when we were kids. The creaky, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. The, just, yeah. just as an explanation, Michael's house is sided with essentially deck boards and, and PVC panels. So it's, it's a little it's, unusual it in, is, mu in multiple colors. In multiple <laughs> colors, which is usual for us. Yeah. But it is, it's, I think it's one of the first where everything is done in a three quarter or a one inch PVC. And what's behind that PVC? A bit, uh, a, 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 a well, we have a control layer. Yeah, oh, control layer. Right. I like the way you like brought us back <laughs> around, man. Yeah. Yeah. Why did pay me the big bucks? Yeah. Keep me on desk. So we have um, a ventilated rain screen uh, behind our panels, and the other stuff is open joint, which is a whole other story. Um, so yeah, so we have that ventilated rain screen, which I think, Carl, you and I, of all the things we don't agree on, we, we agree on this Vented thing. rain screens, yes. Yeah. If there's one thing that we wish all builders would do. Yes, absolutely. They're, it, they're very forgiving. Uh, hold on. I'm going to phone a friend. Uh, Joe, do you have any issues with ventilated rain screens? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and for the record, Mr. Stebrick just said that that is the only thing that he agrees with Michael and Carl about is that ventilated rain screens are good. Size <laughs> matters. <laughs> I'm not going to ask about your personal life together, but... <laughs> Mind the gap. I, I, think, I don't think you'll get any argument from any of us here that uh, a ventilated rain screen does a tremendous amount for a building, right? So we're, we're what? We're allowing the water to get behind the cladding like it's going to inevitably and drain out of that assembly. But at the same time, if we have is something of a vapor open wall assembly, it's also going to allow that wall behind it to dry out. So I, I can't see anything wrong with any of that. No, there isn't. Actually, speaking about vapor, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is that where I live, we really don't care about vapor transmission a whole lot. What you know, do the, you care about in Georgia? Yeah, I don't, care about, I don't care about. You don't care about insulation. You don't care about vapor. I don't care about anything. <laughs> no, no, my point is, Give that it up people, on life. people talk about vapor retarders all the time in cold climates, and it's like I actually had an architect the other day, all concerned about the dew point. And it's like, don't worry about the dew point. It really doesn't happen in Georgia very much. <laughs> Does it? 
Well, it depends on what you set your air conditioning to. If you're right, keeping yeah. it at 58 in the house, like yeah, I like it, you might have a problem. Not too many people do that. I, yeah. I don't know. I, I read in your in your house that you turned off your dehumidifier. You just turn your air conditioner down. I removed my dehumidifier because it blew out <laughs> too much hot air. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, you're out there, man. You're way yeah. out there. No, but I, I've, I, I see people still see people occasionally. Like I was in a multi, a apartment building in Pittsburgh, actually, and they had specified polyethylene vapor barrier on the inside walls. And we said, I don't think that's a good idea because you have air conditioning in this apartment and it's going to mold and they refuse to take it out. Well, oh, but they're taking it out now. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. The, the remodeling contractor who's removing all the mold remediation, that yeah. person is it's taking all right. it out. The mold's behind the polyethylene. <laughs> right. <It's laughs> okay. They can't it's see it. It's, it's in the walls. Yeah, it's it in the walls. Right. Okay, okay. But, I'm learning a lot here. You know, Carl, you used that word vapor retarder, and then you talked about the architect who had a vapor barrier. And I think one of the reasons why we're using the language control layers is that these the, the barrier part of it turned out to be a big problem, especially for those of us that have both climates, right? And we're going one way, then we're going the other way. And this whole notion of, it's not about uh, total dominance, right? It's about intentional control. So we're deciding what we want the permeability of this assembly to be and putting something in place that will allow some vapor to move through without ever bottlenecking in that assembly. So, I mean, that vapor, that vapor control layer can can be a real bastard. I mean, if right, if you screw that one up in the wrong climate, there's this kind of cascading uh, line of effects that will take the house apart, right? So that can I mean, possibly even kill the occupants, depending on who it is. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, we can't keep sand, you know, from getting in your shorts at the beach. And sand is a lot larger than like air or water molecules. So the notion that we could create something that is like perfect, perfect, it's just like I said, like we'd be doing TIG welded stainless steel shells on all of our houses if we were really trying to control it. That would be uh, awesome. That would be awesome. Submarine houses above grade. I'm what about it. the thermal bridging? Who cares Shipping about that? Containers. If you've got enough money to TIG weld a stainless steel house, <laughs> you're not caring about how much it costs to heat. I was cool. trying to loop back in some more control <laughs> layer talk, Ben. Work with me. I thought we already discussed thermal wasn't that important. Yeah. <laughs> well, for some. <laughs> to, to what Michael was saying, a lot of these things that we start putting together in building assemblies, I think of them as like valves that we can uh, kind of choose how much we're going to allow those valves to be open and close for the amount of whatever flow of energy that we want through that wall. I like that. And like, it's not to sound that heady, but that's really kind of what we're doing. If only it were that easy. If I could just install four valves A on the wall. A vapor valve on the wall. Yeah, up yeah. oh, vapor, air, but they yeah, thermal. thermal. <laughs> but wait, don't they sell these Water. membranes that are supposed to do that? The, the ones with the IQ? Yeah, the yeah. smart right, ones. Right, right, right. Smart, ones. smart yeah. pieces of yeah. plastic. I mean, yeah. <laughs> smart plastic's a thing. Or you could just move the insulation, you know, outside of the wall. Yeah. Or at least some of it. And then, like the one that we did with the two inches of insulation on the outside, once you hit R10, the at least in the north in Minnesota, the requirement for vapor control layer disappears. Because everything that's happening now is happening out there in space and we're not too worried about it. So, I mean, there is that. Yeah, and if you do a really good job air sealing on the skin of the building, yep. you're really gonna get almost no vapor going in. And if you do a really good air sealing on the interior face on the drywall, you get very little vapor going into the wall cavity. So you pretty much eliminate your vapor issues. Yeah, because much more vapor is carried on one small air leak than it is right. across the whole surface of the wall. Right. So. Do you guys remember that naked carpenter analogy that we used? No, but I'm curious. No, please repeat. <laughs> if this is a visual aid, I'm not. I, I'm past. <laughs> no, no props. No, no. Oh, can't really. Come on, Carl. Let's do it. No. This is. <laughs> Be my guest, Michael. Yeah. I mean, if it was radio, we could pretend we could pull, like that was we, just happening. We could pull that off. Yeah. No pun intended. So we have the, the naked carpenter in Minnesota. With the notion being. Uh, if you just air seal, this is akin to wrapping the carpenter in saran wrap and sticking them outside, uh, and, and they're probably going to die, right, <clears throat> fairly quickly. And then, uh, okay, so you take the saran wrap off and you put them in a fleece, you know, nice lofty kind of fleecy thing, and you stick them outside, and, you know, the wind blows right through it. So, yeah, they're warmer, but they still die fairly quickly, right? And then you put them in, you know, uh, a nice down fleece jacket and then you 
put a raincoat, you know, the, remember those yellow Mortensen rubber raincoat things? The Gordon's then, Fisherman. The, the Fisherman, the, the Gordon's yeah. Fisherman thing. And, and then they're just drenched, then they, right? And then yeah. they're cold and then they're also dead, right? So then you buy them a nice Gore-Tex jacket, which is your smart plastic in theory, right? And it's on the very outermost layer. So there's the air sealing, there's ability for vapor release, then there's their insulation, and then, you know, oh. happy carpenter. Yeah, you Simple, managed right? for bulk water with the outer layer and all the way down through all the control layers. Yeah. You've got it all handled now. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Naked so, carpenter. So Gore Tex jackets for our house. Yeah. yeah. That's really what we need. Yeah. Architerics, come on, help us out. We need. Have you seen how much their jackets cost? Can you imagine how much one big enough to oh fit a house God. is going to cost? But it would be sexy. Oh, I mean, so could you, it would have articulated seams it would and be lots a, of zippers. It would be a living building challenge house. Ooh, <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Oh, the, the Gore-Tex? Oh. Yeah. The, the, the stuff in it? Yeah. Why not? It could or couldn't be a living building. It could oh, be. It could be a living building. Right. Yeah. I thought you were going to say that something in the, the chemistry of the... Yeah. Mm. Gore-Tex well, I don't would be know on what's the on the red list, yeah. so yeah. it's possible. You know, everything's on the red to list. Digress. Everything's, uh, yes. <laughs> to, to digress. Everything's very difficult. difficult to this, this, living building challenge is on the red the list. The li- living building challenge is really <laughs> is interesting, red. but <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a concern about it. Like, So for a living building challenge for a single-family house, it pretty much has to put it in somewhat of a rural or a very suburban area, because without that, you can't get the solar and the water and the, and the waste management issues, which is kind of the dumbest thing to do with a house, is put it in a place where it's not close to transportation and close to walkability. So, so but, it's just, it's but everybody's just, moving out of the cities and buying houses in the country. And they all everybody, ride everybody is bad. Everybody, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely everybody. And I didn't envision you through the naked carpenter out in the middle of the city. I mean, come on now. Nobody was thinking that. Good times. Good times. But you don't deny envisioning the naked carpenter, <laughs> for the record. Hey, now. She does it all the time. The, sh- the shrink wrap visual was really... <laughs> Disturbing? Something that was, yeah, something. <laughs> so we've talked about all of the control layers. We've talked about the relative importance of them. Because it is, I mean, the house is a system. So we, we've sort of bandied about the interplay of all of these different layers and how crucial it is based on your climate zones and how different they are and the complexity of these systems. So from the designer's perspective, our resident architect, Emily, in the absence of Mike, uh, who is quick to say he's not an architect, but he's doing a fantastic job of designing homes. So what can you tell us about, from the inception of a project, designing for these control layers, what are the criteria that you're looking at first? Obviously, the site, which you mentioned just a minute ago is important, but climate zone, uh, your client's needs. Like, this is this is complicated stuff. The control layers aren't just for the guys in the field with the hammer. There's an awful lot more on the front end before we get to be involved. I know you're more involved now. Don't rub it in. Uh, but Emily has probably thought more about this than I have. What's the story? Yeah, because it's really disappointing, and I'm sure you guys will say the same thing as builders, is when someone comes to you and says, okay, I have this great design and I really like it. Now let's make it better performing. Well, it's too late. It's too late at that point. It's too late to make it simpler, easier, because when you're thinking about the control layers, anytime you got a bump, a jog, a dormer, anything in that, it makes it more complicated. I I thought you can fix it with spray foam. (laughs) You can't fix anything with spray foam. Spray (laughs) foam's a bad word. Wait, actually, whoa, whoa, whoa. actually, actually, all right, let's do it. Let's do it. Wait, 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 wait. I gotta start this one. I have come to the conclusion that a new house using spray foam is an excuse for a bad design. <laughs> it's true. I'm, I'm not gonna that. argue that one. <laughs> yep. And Michael, Michael's fuming over there. He's like, I'm not fuming. What is wrong? <laughs> 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 well, you know, you know, trying to get rid you know of this saying about and opinions, everything that right? you can. So two Jews, five opinions. This is how it works. <laughs> uh, so okay, so Emily, what's the beef with spray foam? What's the beef with spray foam? Well, aside from it being a potentially toxic material or whatever, in our climate zone, as Angel was describing. Things dry out and then they separate and they separate from that. And now you've got air fissures, you've got places for vapor to go. And it's not uh, it's not the air barrier solution that everyone thinks it is. Could it work? Maybe. Does it work all the time? Not necessarily. So uh, in our practice thus far, we've only really found that spray foam on a rubble stone foundation and a renovation might be a good solution, but 
everywhere else we can design out the spray foam and have an equally good low carbon assembly. Yeah, I think spray foam is often the only logical solution for a renovation project. Because, you know, the, the trying to insulate and air seal a complicated structure that's existing without it is very challenging. But, but if you're designing a new home and you design it in such, with such a complicated volume and shape that you have to use spray foam, I think you've really just not, you've not done a good service yeah, to the client, to the contractor. You've not thought about it. You've tried to make it more efficient after the fact. You're trying right. to make it meet code you're, after the fact. You're trying to polish a turd, basically. Yeah. <laughs> polish a turd. Our, our general goal for the projects that we're doing for new construction, because retrofit and renovation, I totally agree, those are the places where we end up getting shoehorned into spray foam working. We're trying to go for no plastic foams above grade. Um, and that's generally that's very attainable, except for in r really weird, wacky situ situations like really indoor, rare indoor pools and stuff like that is where we get into some issues. But I feel like you're also putting an awful lot of faith in your tradesmen when you when you when you design in something that has to be executed perfectly with the right the right mix of two parts, the right temperature conditions, the proper level of dryness of the members that you're going to apply it to. Like you have introduced a whole host of challenges for someone to overcome that is probably not a chemical engineer on site. It's probably somebody who some of most of our spray foam installers, and I don't mean this as a bash, probably struggle with basic middle school reading levels. Right, yeah. and, and it's, yeah, essentially it's you've not, got... And it's not, you've got it's a, not a dig. This is the workforce no, no, that we're yeah, dealing with. But you've got a yeah. factory yeah. in a truck on the job site, yeah. and, that, and you're really hoping that it will work, that the, the product will come out the right way. And they're measuring the temperature at the tank and then running it through a 300-foot hose across the frozen yard, up the stairs with the open windows, and they're saying, no, our chemistry is the right temperature. We're fine. <laughs> it's like, but what's happening in the line? Like... Yeah. It, 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 to me, it's just a bridge too far. You're asking for something that's extremely difficult to control, to work perfectly, and I just think you've reduced your margin of error, and so if you can avoid that, I feel like you should. Well, I also think, when have you ever had enough time on your project to take the time that everything's dry, everything's in perfect condition, the moisture content in your wood is perfect for that installation? I mean, what? is that happening? One of the last live BS and Beers we had that Mike was hosting, we went up and we had a rep from one of the major spray foam manufacturers uh, there to talk to us about spray foam. and. Uh, he went through the, the install parameters for what we needed to have in our building for temperature and for moisture content and stuff like that. And he told us, well, you know, we need the, the wood surface to be 15% or lower, which is what it's delivered from the lumber yard as. And I happen to be that nerd that I bury wood moisture sensors into my buildings, and I also dehumidify my buildings when they're in the framing stage. And we had a house that was at that point where it was weathered in and dehumidification running, and I pulled up the monitoring and I showed him that my lumber was still 21%. And that was at the time that they were supposed to be installing spray foam. So they're trying to give people these things that, and say that, you know, the lumber is already at that condition and ready to be sprayed. Well, but I was showing live data that it wasn't. I, I have to admit that you're really, really interested in it. So you checked your wood. I, yeah. how, frequently, how, check wood? How, yeah. how frequently are people actually going to that level of detail? They read the manufacturer's specifications. They were like, this is what it needs to be. We checked all of this Temperature stuff. Temperature has to be 32 and rising. Yet I see guys out when it's 15 degrees spraying new builds. Yeah. You're so, telling me that that sheathing's 32 degrees and rising? But, Absolutely. But the foam makes its own heat. It'll raise the temperature. It'll be fine, Dad. Oh, my dad. It's okay. Yeah. yeah, a little. But, okay, so, just because. Counterpoint. I mean, mm -hmm. it's why we invited you. Against one, why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, a couple of things. First, I think um, there are very few products out there that, that are foolproof, right? No question. And, and I think I've seen lots of bat installation that's not done right. Oh, like, ab absolutely. I mean, yeah. bat installation is infinitely harder to do well than spray foam installation. I would, say I would reject that. Okay. No, so. Fiberglass is the only method that can't reach a grade one install under ResNet standards. So I'm right. not going to argue with you there. And, yeah. and again, we're making all kind of like, what actually happens? Well, the guys who stuff bats for a living they also are reading at maybe, uh, I don't know, whatever grade level. The, the care and the attention that's being paid, the number of homes that we've gone through and we've seen, they just push it back, the electrician pushes it back, it gets halfway. I mean, we rarely see fiberglass bat or bat ins insulation installed well. Agreed. So, right? Right. But, uh, so that, if we're gonna say that, oh, the spray foam uh, guys uh, can't do it, uh, and uh, so uh, therefore <laughs> there might be a gap, 
I'm sorry, but the bat installation guys have got gaps all over the yeah. freaking but, but, but if we wait, can't wait. get bats right, then why are we going to get well, on-site manufacturing of yeah. complex I chemistry it, right? So, again, I think that speaks to, you know, as a builder or a remodeler, if you are going to use certain products, then then you need you are responsible to take the steps that are required in order to make sure that the install is done right. If you're going to go out and do double wall, right, you're paying a ridiculous amount of attention to your details because you can't screw up those detail, details, right? If I'm doing SIP wall construction, my SIP panel details have got to be bang on or I'm going to have catastrophic failure. So likewise with foam, it's not a silver bullet solution and if it's being pitched or used like that, that's not an appropriate use of the product. But it doesn't mean that it's not a good, useful product. When we're doing things like Zip R12, where we know that we don't have solid connections between our foam panels, there's all kinds of little uh, gaps all over that geometry because of how thick it gets, having a really good air seal on the inside of that wall is a critical part of that assembly. So I have a couple products I could choose, right? I can spray like a latex, like a certain tea type product, and like go through everything. Like that eco-seal that was around. Or the eco-seal. Yeah. Or I can put two inches of spray foam insulation, which is going to bond nicely to the back of that foam board, and I'm going to get a really good air seal and a little bit of an extra insulation that I need. So I think that it's more about right product, right application. That's always true. And, and there, too, it's like, yeah, if everyone wanted to build boring Swedish-looking A-frame houses, you know, yeah, we can simplify the geometry to that point. But in the States, real world, this is just like real world, right? People in the States like ugly houses, right? You know, go to New Jersey. Ugly, complicated houses. It's kind of a hallmark of our culture. It's the hallmark of our culture. We build ugly houses. The McMansion with the little witch hat. 17 yeah, yeah, different yeah. roof angles. Yeah. That's not changing. All dumping so, into one courtyard. Yeah, in the so front. we can be like, you know, yeah, well, Ivory Tower, we should all be building, you know, pretty good houses with, you know, one roof angle. But that's just not what happens. And so but, but in the, that situation, what are the tools available shut to him us? up for a second. Jesus. Right? No. <laughs> what would you like to say, Carl? Well, but one of the things we work on in our, in our apartment buildings on multifamily projects we get grade one bat insulation all the time sometimes it's a struggle but you get grade one bat fiberglass oh, oh, yes these have guys you seen how tall carl is I've when he walks one. on the job site he demands it no, they do no, it no but well, wait he's a hers raider is he not because i would have to agree with him that the thing that we're missing is insulation inspections to get to grade one because yeah. it is it, extremely important si and we, single family we projects do it. almost it almost never happens but in the multifamily projects, generally we're getting it. It's some, sometimes it's a struggle. I guess it's, it's a mistake on my part because I thought that it wasn't even possible to reach no, no, a grade one with fiberglass. It's, fiber it's definitely possible, yeah. Maybe Unfa it's just that it's unfaced really bats, safe. we're getting a lot, a lot of high quality installations. Yeah. That's why we bring these guys on. They're controversial. They have controversial takes. There's a lot of <laughs> things that do not <laughs> jive with all the information out there. You bring Michael and Carl on. That's Carl, can I, can I borrow your insulators? They're, can they're, I import they're, them to Connecticut? I'll take them. Uh, they probably don't work on. They, they're just production multifamily guys. They don't. The single family guys are terrible. They just like it just does. It just doesn't turn. It never turns I out. I saw right. dollar signs there for a moment. <laughs> sorry, sorry, to, sorry to disillusion you, Ben. Um, let's jump. Let's jump back to the water control layer because I had some some points I wanted to make. Like water. Yeah, I mean, you know, so we got we got zip sheathing, we got house wrap. They're liquid applied, which we don't see a whole lot of. Again, I've seen it in some apartment buildings, not a whole Peel lot. Peeling sticks. Yeah, but the peel, uh, self adhered, self adhered. Both peel and stick, same thing. Um, I, my, my frustrating thing is, is that they're all good if they're installed right. They're rarely installed right. When you were talking, you were talking with Christine earlier about the zip sheathing and how great it is. It's like it's great if they roll the tape. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that, that's that, a big if and right we, there. We do a lot of waterproofing inspections, and they the, they do a terrible job with the zip tape all the time. And the other thing which makes me really crazy is. In general, builders want to get the siding on because it tends to be like a draw schedule thing. And I can't count the number of times where they have done a reasonably good job with the weather barrier, sided it, and then come in and drilled all the holes for the mechanical stuff. And what they've done is they have oh. just created leaks that they cannot oh, fix. Oh, yeah. No, we want to have the light sconce over there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was at a job once and they were putting masonry up and there was a, there was a hose bib sticking out that was not flashed. And it's like, stop, flash the freaking hose bib. You know, and, I, and what I try and get, my, I, I tell my clients, it's like, don't do any siding, any masonry until everything's installed and inspected. 
Make well, sure that's it's like right. not yeah. to give a plug yeah. for a manufacturer, but Quick Flash over here, they make oh, those the, line yeah. set hoods. Great. Because yeah. awesome. that's one of the ones that's always an issue because you don't right. want to get the line sets installed too early because they're going to get damaged. Right. So it's how do you deal with that? They the make thing, a product I, what that you I, what just I recommend for like is through. just stick a piece of PVC pipe that's, down the wall. So that's my angle it down and flash it. A piece of three yeah. inch with a 45 on yeah. it is a great way. I also tell people if you have a mechanical room on the exterior of your house, just stick a couple of pipes in. <laughs> You don't know what's going to need. You don't know what's yeah. going to need later. Just you'll stick use, a couple of pipes in, cap them, and flash yeah. them. And then do, if we you have do that to, with conduits. Seriously. Yeah, right. Just like have uh, conduit cables. Exactly. Let's, yeah, let's yep. say you're going to get fiber optic sometime. It's yeah, like, one of the things that we're starting. Like what, that why idea. is that funny? That's, that's <laughs> awesome. Like that's brilliant. Huh? <laughs> well, and you're reinforcing your lack of interest in air control because I'm envisioning this they fiber optic caps, line going to this. No, 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 no. You're feeling it back. You put, you put a pipe in there, you cap it. It's a good use of fiberglass <laughs> insulation inside. Yeah, a great yeah, one. What is it? Whatever you put, whatever you put in there, you can then foam around it. Oh my God. Just a little bit of foam. You just found a new way for Michael to get more foam into his house. But, <laughs> but to just, it just to throw something out there that's in that same vein, something that we're doing often now is, is we're installing PVC conduits to the attic in houses because we think that eventually they're solar. probably going to end up with solar. Yeah, absolutely. So we're prepping it and bringing it down close to the panel, yeah. taking photos of it. So when the client decides to finally put solar on the roof, it's already there. It's like, already roughed in. We don't right. have to tear apart the house and they going... don't have to have some ugly conduit on the oh, outside. I was going to say, why are you going through? Why not just put yeah, the ugly then conduit you don't on the outside? That. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, see, Michael prefers PVC on the outside of the house. So I do. Really, I do. We can put but do they have like colored grain Michael puts grain pretty conduit on the outside of his house, not ugly conduit. No. <laughs> I have a ser serious bone to pick with the line set cover manufacturers because they make the stuff in like ugly one, ugly two, and ugly three. <laughs> It right. is one of those, one of those might corrode through your line set too if you happen to oh, get it wet. I'm thinking the plastic, the yeah. plastic line set covers. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, they're yeah, like yeah. light switch covers. Yeah, they're white biscuit, and almond. White and, almonds. Yes. I've seen. I just see gutter guys. Just you know, just just. Take, just cut up in a downspout. Just run it in gutter. Just run it in downspout. Yeah, just run it in downspout. It looks fine. You can't. You just, you just look, it disappears in the house. He just nice. said, for the record, Carl just said, run it in downspout. It looks fine. <laughs> <laughs> it just looks like a downspout. It works. <laughs> So many downspouts <laughs> everywhere. Remember that Carl is the same one that says he's seen the grade one installation all the time. So I, I'm <laughs> questioning, you may or may not have eyesight is what I'm wondering about at this point. So, yeah, you've seen the grade one, but you've also seen a beautiful downspout in lieu of an actual <laughs> conduit. I love you, Carl. Oh, my God. So, so I was, yeah, no, I was just going to say it was interesting how we keep going back to if it's done right. Right. right that's everything. The t you know, just like the foam, right? Good guy running a good truck, running a good rig, doing their tests inside. Great application, beautiful foam. 20 years later, still looks beautiful when you pull off a piece of drywall, right? Same thing with the tape. If you don't roll the tape, yes. all that hard work is gone. Or if you roll it over sawdust. Like, or if there, you, there I always do that. Actually, you like to I make sure that it fails. Otherwise. It's, I have it's, a great oh, picture to of a house fingers. where they had <laughs> two by four tow boards on the roof and they rolled the zip tape over the tow boards. Oh, <laughs> oh nice. God. Beautiful. I'm going to get, get up for our next Halloween show. That's beautiful. Oh, all right. <laughs> That's going to be great. Have you, so have you guys played around much with the new self? I feel like self adhere WRBs, there's a... There's a couple on the market now. I feel like. Are you asking me if I've fought them and wrestled them to the death? Yeah, <laughs> I've survived. You survived <laughs> through With my limited exposure. Hair I feel my, like my beard used office. to be to my waistband. <laughs> 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 I've heard they're very challenging uh, to get to work. Some, Everything some has a learning curve. They're not it's that whether bad. Whether it's been installed, you know, it's, yeah. has, has it been installed well? Because they've practiced. Your guys, I'm sure, have wrestled these things and are good at working it taut at both top yeah. and bottom consistent tension all the way across a second set of hands there's just tips and tricks to everything but it, it's yeah. it's doable yeah it's 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 really doable, oh, it's super doable. i'm sure you found it too because you've done it and i was part of the development team of some of those products and i've used a number of, i think i've used all of them at this point now in my career uh yeah they're totally approachable like if you can figure out how to get Tyvek on a wall flat, you can figure out how to get a peel and stick on the wall flat. <laughs> I don't know. I think there's and a, you a little, have to little different there. You, go. Like yeah. you don't have stick. to staple as you go. It, there is some patience to it. I've noticed that the carpent, the older carpenters get really impatient. Like they're like, yeah. just smooth it down, and then it wrinkles and it bubbles, right? And the guys who are newer to it are willing to go s slower and kind of work it through. I would agree, though. I don't know if we're allowed to ne mention names or anything, but I don't see why not. But, None of our names, but yeah, your names. Ahead. But the 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 Obdike self-adhered, which is using a solid acrylic, is a lot lighter tack, right? Once it's been rolled, 
it sticks incredibly well, right? Yeah. Super sticky after you roll it, but when you're setting it, you can set it, pull it back, set it, pull it back. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. It makes a huge difference on the install. So if we're just saying names, the Obdike and then Sega, those are the two that I'm familiar with that are both full-bodied acrylics, and they have some repositionability, yeah. which is nice because some of the others, like uh, the Blue Skins and which the Vicors, which are a highly modified Butyl, those are, it's a one-shot deal. As soon as it hits, Whew. it's like doing ice and water on a roof valley on a 90-degree day. Once it touches, it's game over. But I have to say something, though, that I have... Uh, that, a, a reservation. I'm curious to hear everybody else's thoughts about these peel and sticks because my concern is, is if they're not really well adhered in some locations and we end up getting water behind them, it's going to concentrate all that water into one location and hold it there. A little belly going? Yeah, exactly. You're going to get that little like fish mouth belly thing. Like, yeah. That, you know, have you guys ever seen the picture where it was like the Tyvek taped at the bottom of the wall and there was clearly <laughs> right. a water yes. and it looked like a, a, a water bed on yeah. the outside? I'm afraid of something like that happening. I'm, it's probably just me, like I said, staying up at night obsessing over pointless things in yeah. my life. Uh, but <laughs> I, I used to call that precipitation anxiety when I was a contractor. <laughs> but Dan, it's fully justified. Dan totally. Colbert, who we all know, has a saying that if you want to guarantee that you never sleep well again, learn building science. <laughs> And right, <laughs> ignorance is and, such and be bliss. a contractor. But, right? that's, but realistically, that's my only uh, cognitive hang up on peel and stick yeah. uh, membrane. It's an interesting one. I, I, in my brain, I instantly had this visual of like young, you know, fit carpenter. That's the peel and stick when you put it on, and then like Travis. And then as you age, <laughs> and then it's starting to look start a little look bit more like, like me. And then you yeah. eventually get to carpentry. looking like me, you know, where it's just kind of this, this, this. over the waistband. Yeah. Eventually, you look like Basic, and it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. Just Steve's not just here, but he'd uh, probably beat us up for that. He one. probably would. He, he's an ex-marine. I'd be careful That's what you true. say about yeah. him. <laughs> he doesn't move very fast, though. So we got that going <laughs> he for you. Run really fast. <laughs> no, but there is there is something too. Like, how do these things age, and what happens over time? I personally, I think. One of the things that lets me sleep through the night when I'm thinking about this particular one is the notion that over this peel and stick, I have another layer that's been fastened and over that, I've got another layer that's been nailed on pretty tight and that it's really holding it all in place. And that when we get to our penetrations, we've switched, right? In those places, we're using different tapes that have different adhesion, cohesion, whatnot, for those of us who are doing that. So less likely that air is going to be able to get back underneath the building papers at that point. But, I mean... That takes you back to the importance of the system. So we got to talk about materials compatibility now. If you're going to start introducing different things to your system, they have to play well together. So if you're doing a peel and stick, you've got to stay within that system. Because if you put one thing on that that it does not like, you have now not just done a poor job of oh, man, flashing here, but now you've ruined this. Sorry, Ben is distracting me by pointing out things on his beer can. Yeah, my apologies. It's a compatibility issue. Ben it's a not compatibility compatible issue. with Bud Light. And so <laughs> no, I'm perfectly a... compatible with Bud Light. I'm just cur questioning why there's rice in my beer. Um. <laughs> okay, this is completely unrelated, but... No, it's BS and beer. Carl, it's totally it's related. It's beer. It is, it is totally point. related, but I have to share this. I was watching a football game the other day. Do you know there are warning labels on the back of every helmet telling you that you can suffer brain damage if you play football? That's awesome. It's legitimate. It's great. It's like there, the warning on his pack of cigarettes yeah. on the side of a beer. I was yeah. just, it was one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen. I actually looked it up online. It's like it's a standard label. Coffee is also hot. What about if I use it to headbutt a wall? <laughs> I, apparently, it's, you know, it's, it's still okay a problem. Yeah. Well, it's still a problem. Tra Travis, you bring up a really interesting point, and this is this idea that you know, there's folks out there who gripe about, oh, you know, I, we used to be able to build this, this, and the other. We, we never had to do any of this fancy stuff, and right? Our materials have gotten more complex, right? Our was wood, right. is, it comes in more than one flavor, yeah. right? So we, it's, not, it's no longer good enough, I think, to just say OSB. You almost have to call out which OSB you're using because that OSB is very, very different than that OSB. From that OSB, they, right? They don't even resemble each other. The tapes are the same thing. We've got so many different tapes that do different things, and some of them are more compatible with some WRBs than others. I mean, it's almost like- Some of them are more compatible with working in the cold than others. Right. Some of them are not compatible with EPDM at all. Vinyl window flanges. Right, so I, it almost like we need to start to put these things into classifications of compatibility, if you're doing this, these are your choices. You know, don't go yeah, over here. I think I think Tyvek. It's, it's not labeled. Tyvek has a list of compatible sealants that work with it. And That's on a the lot instruction page, Carl, which we don't 
It doesn't, you know, it's mystical. No, well, no, we don't no, no. actually When read you it. open up a product, you, this, there's this piece of paper in there and you go like that. That's yeah. exactly because, what we do. why should a contractor read the instructions? But you I use also... that to rub the ceiling on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I got an acoustical <laughs> ceiling on my hands. Ceiling I need napkin. something. Ceiling napkin. Well, for <laughs> exactly <laughs> this reason, that's why when you go to your building department, wherever you buy most of your building materials, there should be someone on staff who can be like, what do I need for X? And they can be like, what do you have? And there can be a compa- you know, there's a decision tree. I have X. I'm doing Y. I need, you know, these Oof. three materials. Or enter the importance of the designer who puts it on the plan, it and then you don't have the, to yeah. worry about that. You can order it from your supplier in advance, and you don't have to do any thinking as the builder. You show up and you build the plan you were and given it's, it's, with the products. That it's were good listed. for builders not to think too. As, as long as you're, hey. as, oh, as, we as long as with you're working with excellent builders like yourself who actually read what we write on our plans. That's fair. That's fair. I do want to point out also, to your point, that, well, this is very complex. We have all these different materials. It's a lot more to consider. That's true, but we also have all these tools as builders, and I no longer hammer my staples in with an adjustable wrench. <laughs> I use the hammer. <laughs> like, right tool for the job, right? I learned. How long did it take you to get from wrench to hammer? Well, I met Ben, uh, I don't know, I what, a couple met, years ago. And he was like, hey, it. pro tip, that adjustable wrench is actually not for that. It's yeah. better if you use a metric one. Right? <laughs> a metric adjustable? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. It's, uh, it, one of the common things that I tell people is, is like, uh, you know, I started in this industry industry in the 90s and I'm sure there's people here that have been at it longer than me but when I started when I started you could take a carpenter from anywhere in the country and put them on a job site and they'd pretty much know what to do it was 2 by 4 16 inch on center fiberglass baths in the wall Tyvek on the outside X cut the Tyvek into the window opening nail the siding on the outside of that now we have advanced framing, we have exterior insulations, we have vapor open exterior insulations, we have foams, we have compatible sealants, we have window flanges, we have all of these things that we have to keep track of. So as a builder nowadays, we're like in the information uh, herding business. Like really that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis as a project manager. I am just shepherding information back and forth between different parties because it's not so cut and dry anymore. I'll add on to that and that the, the, even the builder, what, what we call a builder today, versus what a builder might have been in the 50s, 60s, 70s is also very different where you maybe had a builder who was an on-site builder with a framing crew and they were there through all the process versus a modern builder, which, you know, I've got my computer in my desk and I've got 42 subs and they're on a schedule and each of them's gonna we, go out and call, perform a we task. We call it a windshield and a checkbook. I mean, I, I call it builder. smart. But yeah, same here. I'm right? not arguing with it because at all. those other guys also didn't want anything new. Yeah. They they wanted to do the same thing, and and a modern builder is willing to entertain. Okay, different system, different materials, but then they're still stuck relying on trades that don't talk to each other, and and that continuity between the different people who may or may not use what you specified. Right, that uh, when you're small builder is one thing where there's lots of control but as the builder gets bigger and they're on multiple projects we have 14 projects running at a given time there's no way that we're going to be able to well, check and, up and on there's, every and there's, single and there's one two of them. issues in in residential in residential construction especially custom residential construction it's hard to charge enough to pay people enough to really spend the time managing the projects i mean all your projects probably could do with a full-time manager on site all the time but you you can't afford that it just it doesn't work doesn't work people don't want to pay for that people don't want to pay for people don't want people don't want to pay for we bill hourly for our site supervision and yeah. project management and yeah it's, it's and that, a, that's it's great that you can do that and then on top of that the subcontractors frequently again they don't they don't talk to each other and they often don't know enough about the project so, and the, so the superintendents often don't have enough detailed information and the subcontractors don't have enough detailed information and when i come in as a third-party verifier i'm basically just looking at all kinds of stuff that nobody's paying attention to. And some, some of it's very simple stuff. Some is literally just installing bad insulation correctly. And they just, you know, they, I, and what I find contractors will say, the sub told me he's done, so come out and inspect. And not only was it not, only was it not done well. He hasn't been there in a week and a half. Right, right. No, yeah. it's like, come inspect the fourth floor. There's no insulation on the fourth floor. The guy told you he was done, but he didn't even show up. So what you're saying is you're not very popular. Oh, they hate us. <laughs> But it's, that's a real struggle, Carl. Like, I yeah. even deal with that. Like, even us uh, billing hourly for that site supervision and stuff like that. Sometimes it's hard because we're stretched so thin trying to shepherd information back and forth yeah. between all these parties to find the time to get in the car and drive to these job sites yeah. and get back. So it's a real challenge. Yeah, yeah for the the smaller residential builder like, like Joe and I, we've got essentially, you know, the same 7 to 14 projects running. 
And our clients don't see value in constant size supervision. They're going, what are you doing here? The concrete's curing. Why are you here? Yeah. Like, I can't bill for that time. I'm on site. I can schedule the next guy. I can make sure that they stripped all the forms and knocked all the wall ties. And I can make sure that we're ready for backfill. But what I can't do is be useful to that job for an eight-hour day every day. So mm -hmm. what we become is you know, master managers of time and you're taking moments from this job and putting them in this, into the what? site time on this job and you're yeah. manipulating and, these schedules in a very complicated just way. Just as a reference point, I work on projects where there are two or three full-time superintendents on these big multifamily projects they and it's still, still can't figure out, they still can't get things right. They still can't supervise things right. You're suggesting and, that the builder's job is difficult, and I'd like to co-sign <laughs> and agree yeah. wholeheartedly. So yeah. this, isn't, this isn't a plug because I have no vested interest in them, but there's a company over here next to us that I got a little peek under the hood when I was talking to them setting up called Foresight. And what they're doing is, is they're doing uh, a whole uh, like hosted platform of quality analysis and quality control along with training for specific products and integration with your uh, local municipalities requirements and also the manufacturer of the products oh. requirements, oh. which like to hear something like that, like obviously there's a lot of pieces in there to learn about, but something like that is like it sounds like our industry is asking for that. So r really, what they do is is they have an app or a piece of software that the installer, when they're in the field, already has the products put together in this, and they just open a video and it shows them how to install it. And then they have a system where the whoever the project manager is can go and take photos and have those uploaded, and they do QA QC versus the manufacturer spec to make sure everything's correct, and then interplay that between the municipality and so on and so forth. So. It's a handy tool. I, if it works, and it sounds <laughs> like it, no, and it sounds like our industry is asking for things like that. There's a lot of there's a lot of different tools that I keep seeing that pop up trying to solve this thing, and I think that's it speaks to the fact that it's a really big issue. You, Carl, you developed a contractor quality assurance checklist oh, many, many, many years ago. Years ago, yeah. Right, it was pretty detailed, and it was mm -hmm. like, is this done? Yes, no. Is this done? Yes, no. And it was old school, like an, an Excel spreadsheet, and but. We're still fighting that same battle, whether it's app or on a clipboard or on a spreadsheet of making sure that we go through and we're so thorough in catching all of the details, right? It always relies on the person inputting yeah. the data. And, and then they have are they going to input it? Are they going to upload the photos? And they're late yeah. and it's cold and it's raining. And, and the drywallers well showed up an afternoon early and started hanging over yeah, that section. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, this is I mean, we it's do, a crazy we the, industry. We do that in our work now. We have, a, we have an app with checklists for our building and closure inspections, our insulation inspections, and it just got, it's got everything, it's got a checklist, everything in it, you have to go through and make sure everything's done right, take pictures, mark them up, and it's, it, it, it's effective in terms of being able to track things. It's not necessarily effective in getting to do them right every time, but at least we can just <laughs> the point out, is. we can point down what they're doing wrong over and over again until they get it right. <laughs> so in true BS and beer fashion, this is the part of the evening where we would actually have audience questions and our chat box would have been going absolutely insane by Ooh. now, but we, we are live. And so uh, if we'll blame it on, questions. we'll make, we'll blame it on Mike, but are there audience questions? So I think we talked about control layers, kind of what they are and what some of the issues associated with installing control layers are. So I'm going to get up, get my own beer. Are there audience questions? Feel free to speak up. Anyone? If you stand and speak loudly, we'll recognize your question. Otherwise, we'll talk amongst ourselves, which might be less valuable to you. Nothing? All right. What? Oh, there's one. Question. Hey. All right. Woo. A brave soul. What can we do for you, sir? Your question was on a brick ranch and you on a remodel. remodel. Can you spray Thank foam you. where at to get air barrier? Okay. Is uh, to it, enhance it's to a, enhance it, the air barrier it's a brick or the air ranch. tightness. It's brick. On a brick house, I'm generally okay with that because you have an air gap. If it was a if it was siding, I'd be reluctant to do it because you could potentially create some moisture issues and cut down some drying. But brick brick will generally work okay. And so, what's your concern if it's not a brick ranch? Can you explain to us like well, what that that the, the, the weather barrier process is? This probably this probably does not have an effective moisture control layer. Probably does not have effective flashing. 
So the fact that it wasn't previously insulated, it's drying out because of no insulation. Once you insulate it- Kiln drying it every it, winter. Yeah, kiln drying it every winter. Once you insulate it, it loses all its drying potential. Um, although I did see a brick ranch recently where the brick was so badly installed, it was mortared directly against the sheathing. <laughs> So they, they what ended could up, ever they go up, wrong there? Yeah. They ended up stripping all the brick off the house and starting over with a, with a new weather barrier, new drainage, and foam on the inside. I, I'm curious, where, where, where in the country is this house? It's in Kentucky. It's hot, it's hot there, and, right? It's probably pretty wet. Moderate. It's kind of moderately hot, moderately moderate. wet. Moderate. Yeah. Mixed climate. And yeah. there's no, there was no insulation in the walls because it's not that cold in Kentucky? It freezes there, Michael. No. There's we snow. have weather There's everywhere. snow in no, other places what? than Minnesota. <laughs> and Maine. It snows in Texas. Connecticut, Connecticut. buddy. Connecticut. Yeah. There was insulation, but you took it out. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, the question that I'm so, hearing is, is just spray foam. We, can you use that to boost the performance of it? Uh, potentially, yeah. if there's an air gap behind the brick, yeah, it should be a totally safe assembly. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, is whether or not to use open cell. No, you'd want to use closed cell in that situation. Oh, I see Michael yeah. grinning. I don't know. He's Either. fine with open. Yeah, whatever. As long yeah. as it's foam. Go hey. down. Yeah. Go down. <laughs> that was a low blow. <laughs> no. I think you could use I'm either. You could use either open or closed. I think you could use either one. Where, you, but yeah, you could. I yeah. don't see why not. Yeah. So, yeah, if there's an air gap outside. Yeah. Op open. Don't, don't and that, folks, was Joe Stebrick chiming in from he, the audience. He disagrees with us. Open. What a surprise. All right. Can, hold on. Can, can we get Joe? Will you stand up and tell us why? Because it's too freaking vapor open. It's too freaking vapor open, to quote Mr. Stebrick. So vapor open foam, right? It's a big deal. So, Joe, remember, I sent you photos a number of years ago of a project we did uh, in Minnesota. We did a... This is when we were new to foam and icing was the thing and it was all open cell and so we went ahead and did it and we would spray it with a vapor retarding primer and came back 15 years later because the client wanted to do a remodel and cut it back and it was beautifully dry back there. So I think open cell foam could be an option but it requires then really good vapor control in front of the foam. And dehumidification yes no? in the house and ventilation. and. <laughs> Wait, no, it gets hotter in Minnesota than it does in Georgia. <laughs> they have seasons. <laughs> so, I, I, I'm not sure. I'll be. Dr. Joe says things go both ways in Kentucky, and he saved us the off color filigree of that other joke there. No, I actually recall, I think one day I sent you a clip of the temperature in Georgia, which was in the 70s, and you were in the 90s in Minnesota that same day. <laughs> it happens. Weather. It does happen. Weather yeah. is a thing. Yeah. Open is risky. We, there yeah. we go. Open is risky. It requires extra steps. <laughs> open is risky. <laughs> we got a thumbs up from Dr. Joe on open is risky. I think that seems like, to be open marriages. Open, all kinds of yeah, things. Uh, agreeably yeah. risky. Open, just risky. risky. Yeah. <laughs> What if they oh, go here both we go, ways? Mr. Scott from the front row with a question. Scott from the front row. Are you guys seeing any increase in advanced framing techniques, or is it just too hard to find a bunch of straight studs to do 24-inch off-center? Ooh, uh, we just did a great presentation yeah, on so that. we just, Tim Euler and I covered advanced framing earlier, and the question was, is are we seeing any growth in advanced framing, or is it too hard to find straight lumber to um, do advanced framing? Uh, first of all, I think there's ways to, uh, that wavy wall thing, I think, uh, isn't totally true, okay? Uh, there's also, there's ways to deal with that. You could go to engineered wood products to frame your walls with. Um, the other thing is, is you could bump up to using 5 eighths drywall inside to help flatten those walls out. The only places where I really worry about that is, is when we have a really long straight hallway with a light source at the end of it, like a window, because that's when you're gonna see every little bit of thing in the wall. Yeah. So uh, otherwise, I, I don't think it's really an issue. And just switch to using LSL or something something like that for your framing material, which we're doing for the interior a lot of times anyways, just to be able to deliver laser straight flat walls for our clients. Uh, particularly we use them when we're doing tile walls and uh, cabinet walls, because then they're really super flat and tall walls uh, I mean, and really stiff and straight and I strong. Like that if a contractor wants to do it, it's 
per they're perfectly capable of doing it. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's the there's the wider there's a wider spacing. There's open corners, ladder tees, right size headers, things of that sort. Single tops. It's it's just that it's so rare that they like if they're subcontracting at the framing, the framers are they're just single minded. They're just blowing through double two by ten header everywhere. You know, closed corners, closed T walls. They just they just don't think to do it differently. But oh, we've got a two inch space underneath that windowsill, and then we're going to put the cripple in there anyways because why not? Yeah, and then right. We're yeah, and like, oh, and they're, they're not sure what the window sizes. There were like eight jack studs. You know? Oh yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we can cut them out afterwards one. and no, make no, the no, window be bigger. You make the opening four feet wide. Because you don't know how big the window is. The window's three, so you, you just, just like in. stack studs in to fill in the window space. Because you know, because studs have great insulated <laughs> value. So <laughs> well, that's like the code right now. So the code is for like every foot of uh, window opening, you're adding a jack, which is like kills right. me because you get like an eight foot wide opening Ooh, and that's a jack jacks, yeah. every side. You're like eight stack jacks on either end of a window <laughs> opening. Like I'm seeing guys that are having to implement this and seeing photos of it. It's like you have a foot yeah. and a half. It's of it's, solid wood on either end of a window nuts, open. Yeah, it's it's, it's crazy. Site build CLT, baby. Sorry. Yeah. Better to switch over that's, to no, steel. No, that's nail laminated timber. So two points on that. The first is straight lumber is useful in both 16 on center and 24 on center. One does not eliminate the other. So doing them a little further apart, it's still crucial to crown your studs. You still just have to pay attention to doing a good job if you want a good job done. And that can be done with LSL if you want to solve that and take the human error out of that. So that's the first point. But the second point is that if we're, if we're gonna talk to our framer beforehand, before we bid the job, and we get them on board and say, what I'd like to do is pay you the exact same amount of money that you are going to get paid to install 16,000 members and you know 48,000 nails. I'm gonna pay you the same amount, but instead I'm gonna only have you install 12,000 and 40,000. Let's go ahead and pay you that same amount and have you do way less work. And only in these places, if you can get them on board early for doing less work and paying them the same amount, usually they're in favor. Now you're still gonna have to manage the site. You're still gonna have to get with them and make sure that they understand it and they execute it properly. But generally speaking, if you offer to give someone the same amount of money to do less work, they usually are more interested, not less. And I, I always would, am. And the, yeah. thing, the thing I love about advanced framing is the insulators charge you by the square foot of wall. So all the extra insulation is free. There you go. <laughs> all true. All 6% of it. Yeah. Hey, that, that's, that's a good amount. Yeah. Sir, come up here. Let's yeah. do the mic. If we talk into the mic, then it gets picked up on the podcast and everybody gets to hear you. If you uh, do a continuous foam on the outside of a, a roof, should you still put a ventilation deck on top of that? I've seen people getting into this, and I don't know if it's really worth the effort, especially climate zone four or five, humid. A ventilated roof is always worth the effort, right, Ben? Yeah, I will always argue for a ventilated roof system over oh, an Dr. unventilated. Oh, Dr. Joe says no. <laughs> well, no. So he's no. asking. He's got a foam. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. He's got a foam. He's the godfather. <laughs> yeah. So you've got, an un, you've got a peel and stick over the whole roof, right? And then you've got foam, and you're asking if you want to put Hey, wait, you're up tomorrow, top. Joe. You're not on this show. No, no, no. We, <laughs> when the godfather's in the audience, you've got to give him a mic. Carl, since you're there, you're going to speak slowly and use small words. <laughs> <laughs> and you can explain it to Hensha later. <laughs> we'll, we'll give him a box of crayons and he can draw him pictures. <laughs> All right. The, the big problem is a ventilated roof is a real problem with uh, wind blow off for hurricanes. It's a real problem with wildfires. It's an insane problem in hot, humid, and mixed humid climates with basically condensation in your cold surfaces. Um, however, so I prefer unvented uh, assemblies in all of those regions, so it's uh, safer and everything else. But in cold places like Minnesota uh, and Wyoming and places where it snows, snow has an R value. It's between R1 and R2 per inch. So where the ground snow load is greater than 60 pounds a square foot, you have to put a ventilated over roof over your unventilated under roof to handle ice damming problems. So you're going to need ventilation and control depending on your climate zone. We were just getting into this with somebody that was talking about doing a, an off-grid cabin in Colorado in a high snow load area and the same type of thing. I don't have any great answers for it. I can't quibble with that. I'm not going to argue with Joe. Yoda. <laughs> don't argue with Yoda. <laughs> Yoda. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. So here, you got your answer. 
Did that satisfy you? Would you like more? No, that's, that's nice. Anyone else? Bueller. Bueller. Oh, hey, yeah. Oh, you guys got a question. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. oh, this is very rapidly going to become Stump the Chumps. And I feel like this is not going to go my way. <laughs> Carl. Yo. What, what, what color of shingles do you have in Atlanta? Oh. Um, Everybody got some- I happen to have sort of a dark gray on my house. Yes, mm. and it's sunny there. Yeah. What temperature are those shingles? I've never measured it. 180 degrees. What's the R value of the shingle and the OSB Woswood, which is the phrase I coined, by the way. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What's the temperature of the underside of the OSB sheathing? I don't know. 170 degrees. Okay. You're aware of something called radiation. Yes. (laughs) All right, so the underside of the roof sheathing is radiation coupled to the top of the fluffy, uh, sorry, the fluffy (laughs) insulation in the assembly. So it's about 150 degrees. So you're going to have 150 degree temperatures on the top layer of insulation in your attic, and you're, what, 70 degrees, 75 degrees inside? 62 if it's my house. Mm. And so for you to say that you don't need insulation in your climate just seems irresponsible. Okay, okay, wait, wait. No, wait, it's good. (laughs) I didn't say I didn't didn't need insulation in my climate. so, So on the southwest side of your walls, and it's, you know, what is the temperature of your white stucco and your brick? You know, 120 degrees. So you're insane. <laughs> I will not Insulation. doubt that I'm insane, but the idea of not, the day of not requiring insulation was actually quite the joke. It yeah. was like, it was a priority thing. All right. So so we're actually going to, Michael and I are going to tee one up here because Joe seems to be on a rip of answering our questions Evidently. here. Evidently. Uh, how about how, how, answering or just like straight up throat punching? <laughs> 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 how about, uh, and this is one that I'm partial to, how about venting a ventilated rain screen cavity into a soffit? Not a good idea. Boo. Why? Because you, you don't want the moisture going up into the soffit and into the roof. Where's this to... magical moisture coming from? Yes, from the ground. About this massive from the, vapor load. From the ground. Yeah. You've got all of this moisture from the ground that's going up the wall, no, then it's, it's dumping it's, into your soffit, and you're getting it's, sucking it's, it through your... Are we where, 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 you're all your attic space. Wide? Yeah. So, so, so you're telling so me that. So you're telling me that there's dramatic. The you're telling me that there's dramatically higher relative humidity at the bottom of the house than there is at the top of the house. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm saying. No. Oh no! Oh man, <laughs> he's Hi. back. Uh-huh. Just make yourself at home, Joe. Come on. There's no reason. To no, do. no. Okay, look. It, it, <laughs> It depends greatly on the cladding system. Is it a reservoir cladding or a non-reservoir cladding? So if you've got basically stucco or brick and you get it wet, it's gonna, the moisture's going to be driven in. It's like a moisture capacitor. If you've got vinyl and aluminum, you don't have that issue. So it, it depends. If, if you have a reservoir cladding, you're going to want to have the stuff certainly not vented into your soffit. If you're in any No kind argument of, from me there. Well, I, I know you're a smart guy. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> we always need a comic foil, no, no, though. That's why we do this. No. Then the other issue is, is that in wildfire areas, it's a horrible thing to ventilate into your into your soffit. In fact, it's that, a admittedly, disaster. the only time that I've ever had any code pushback for that assembly. Well, is I, when I we're, don't think there's any condition where it's a good idea to ventilate into the yeah, soffit. There may be some it? conditions where it's not well, bad, well, but I don't think there's no, no, any benefit no, in ventilating into the no, soffit. No, because you're going to want some ability to dry, and drying doesn't always have to be with ventilation. It can be done with diffusion. Now, the big thing with the rain screen is that you want, in, in wildfire areas, you want it to be less than half an inch or a quarter inch because of the friction of the boundary layer to, you know, to, to stop it. If you yeah, get, get to, it, the sparks to fall out of suspension. Well, it's not yeah. gonna, it's, you're not going to get any flow. If you have a large air gap, you're going to burn people down like they did in, in, in basically Grenfell Towers. That was a two-inch cavity, which was a disaster. If they'd been a half an inch or less, we wouldn't have had 80 dead yeah. people. So you need it to be, this is going to be unusual for me, but smaller is better. (laughs) Joe, can we come and monopolize your talk tomorrow? (laughs) You ask questions. I ask those questions. (laughs) So I, I, I feel like the answer was in my favor. I feel like the answer was it depends. I think that... Uh oh, uh oh, (laughs) no, no, no. Drink. (laughs) So... Let me it's just. Throw my, my, I, I want to understand why why you want to vent it into the soffit instead of having it separate. Half inch air gap, half inch air gap, 
It does its thing, and then the roof is doing its thing. Okay, so so admittedly here, it's a couple of things at play that we drive me to like that detail. Is is uh, number one the aesthetics? I hate having to do that build out at the top to get it vented, and it's not really that I hate having to do that build out at the top. It's that the architects never want to give me enough space to get it to properly. And, and actually, the, the, thing is, the, the painters want to caulk that gap. Bingo, bingo. <laughs> at my house, I had to. Tell the painters, don't caulk that gap. <laughs> exactly. And then the other We're side... We're talking it, about holding the fascia down half an inch from the soffit. And the architects fight me about it. Or, or padding you can't out, see it or from the ground. Or padding it out, yeah. Padding yeah. out the freeze board to create it at the top of yeah. the wall, too, so it vents out in that location. So I get fought there. The other is, is because, as you know, I like to build double stud walls, so I'm always concerned about exterior drying of that wall assembly. So what I, in theory, and I have no data to back this up, is I'm uh, supposing that by tying it into that roof, into that soffit, I am using the enhanced convection created by that hot attic space to draw air up through that wall cavity and to help promote drying through that cavity. I may be totally wrong there, and that's totally like napkin math on my part. Oh, look, two thumbs, two thumbs. I got two <laughs> thumbs up. And now, also, so my question is, is where is this moisture coming from? Where is this mythical well, moisture coming well, from? Well, it's what Jeff said. If it's, if, the, if, yeah. it's, if, it's a, uh, if it's brick or a siding that's gonna absorb sure. moisture, Sun on it is going to create vapor drive. It's sure. going to get vapor into that cavity. Yeah, sure. Lot. Which I was Again. actually about to say before he jumped up and took over our, our presentation. <laughs> and what, what <laughs> percentage of <laughs> claddings are stucco and brick and reservoir claddings? And what percentage? In our, yeah. in our part of the wood, stucco is probably the yeah. most popular in really? Minneapolis. Oh, we okay. do tons of stucco yeah. all the time. I was going to note earlier, he made that comment about brick. I have yet to see any brick that is gapped in residential construction off of the sheeting. Oh, we, we, we were just it's having this construction. We, it's pretty common where we say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We in the North, in Minnesota, it's, it's awful. It's, it's, it's Step rarely your game has, up, Minnesota. Seriously. It's rarely well drained to the if bottom. If you quit wrapping your carpenters in shrink wrap, you might have some good ones left. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, the the mobility is very limited. <laughs> the gap is usually there. The flashing and the drainage above grade is sometimes there. Um, the drainage above windows sometimes, but the gap is usually there. At least. You ever seen a weep? You ever get any of those? A new construction, yeah, but on older yeah. ones, older ones is tough. Yeah. yeah, we see that a lot. Bueller, Bueller, any other questions from More the questions. audience? So All right, quiet. We got it's one coming. Oh, we fear. got a question. Oh, hey. All right. I want to circle back to this question of mitigating movement of PVC. Would it be would it be possible to uh, essentially season a piece of PVC to mitigate that before installation? Like buying it in bulk and letting it sit in the shop for a couple of years. So the question is, is about mitigating movement of PVC by buying it early and letting it season. Like but, firewood. I like this. But your whole your your premise was is that the movement is introduced by the energy imparted to the system via working it. Well, uh, so yeah, like so cut like heat generated by cutting or something like that, or like surface tension by manipulation. Or something? No, I think, he, I think he's making this up. It all yeah, sounds, like, sounds like bullshit size to me. Goes against this entire theory. <laughs> yeah. So let's, let's go. So my, I'm going to shamelessly plug Building Resilience Season Two. Uh, the first episode went live today on ProTradeCraft.com. So check it out. Support Dan Morrison. He is good people. Dan Morrison, uh, fine home building, started Green Building Advisor, is now started pro trade craft so it's really good information um so in building resilience season two we are going to investigate and talk with um asic the engineers over at asic about pvc and um it is above my pay grade so what i can tell you is it as it's been explained to me by dave parker over at asic um is that the process of creating the pvc just the process itself infuses it with energy and this annealing process is like, as I was saying, it's like that pendulum, you know, it's like once you let it go and it swings, it never returns to that point again. And it, I don't know if, if you let it sit out in the yard and it all baked in the sun and then all went through a winter, I, I suspect it would, it would go through that release. That said, um, what I've learned, because I've been doing a lot of PVC work for the last two years, um, is that um, the, the, the trick to the PVC really has to do with how you, where you let it move and how you let it move. Um, and the cool thing about PVC boards is that they don't split, like there's no grain. So if I put a fastener uh, a quarter inch from the edge of my material, the only part of the material that can move is that quarter inch, right? And so then if I pin it again eight inches later, 
that's pinned and it can't, it really is unable to move. So I can mitigate movement and shrinkage um, by, fast by fastening, by fastening appropriately. And then, then the other is, you know, depending on what you're doing with it, if you're using, like we do a lot of Tamlin trims these days and the Tamlin trims have a reveal and that reveal covers up the first half inch of the material. So even if it's pulling back a little bit, it's not visible. What it does not do is expand back beyond its original state. So when we do install PVC, we install it tight. Regardless you of season? Regardless of season, you install wow. PVC tight because when it ships from the factory, it is at its highest. It contains the most energy it will ever contain, and from there it will just lose. That's, so, a, that's, that's a principle that's uh, seen in wood even. It's, it's called case hardening in kiln-dried woods where the, the outside layer is made so tight that it causes a reaction stress inside of it. And uh, it's also seen with cast iron. Like the, the great machinery manufacturers uh, over the years, they used to cast their, uh, their pieces for their machines and they'd go put them in the back 40 for a year or two and let them sit out in the weather so that that huh. machinery would stabilize before they would machine it to finish dimensions. So, Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Makes sense across uh, Michael, materials. do you ever do stuff like put slots slots for the fasteners to give it some room to move? So slots for the fasteners would be something like a like um, uh, Everlast or Select PVC composite sidings. They, they move they more. They expand and contract. They dance around quite a bit, mm -hmm. and you don't want to ever pin those versus a, a solid PVC where you do. So Again, it's like when we say like PVC decking, but it's not actually PVC. And again, this goes to my labeling thing. It's like we have to be really clear which products you do want to pin and which projects, products you do want to let float. They're different because the other ones will buckle and they'll do all kinds of weird things on you. Yes, I have a wonderful <laughs> meeting of it's a scarf joint in a PVC crown right above the steps to my front porch. And it's lovely because every season it's wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> it doesn't matter what the actual is, is air it actually, temperature is. It's actually right for one or two days in between seasons. <laughs> I feel like if I could catch it at a you know 9 a.m. on a perfect March morning when the sun was low in the sky, it might be closed. <laughs> but I know that when I installed it, I fastened the I used the NTSOOI uh, detail that Mark Henriksen popularized on Instagram. If you guys follow Mark, it's uh, it's an architect specified detail. Uh, I think for it's a structural nailing pattern. It's uh, N, nail, T, the, S, O, O, I, out of it. Nail the, the out exactly. Of so this is a detail that I've utilized many times in my career, and I found it to be very applicable, specifically in, in complicated joinery where you're thinking, this is probably going to open up because it's PVC. If, if, if one nail is good, then 11 is surely well, better. You know, you know, that actually brings me, like, what I realize is, like, this whole idea of, like, too much framing material, I think that's all the bl that's all blamed on nail guns. Because when we had, when we had to hammer nails with our hands, we didn't put anywhere near as many stuff. Right? We, we call it us. Uh, so we used to have a joke that we were going to get tour shirts made when we were framing that were going to be for guns and hoses. <laughs> and then the, the the after party band was going to be cat's paws and sawzall. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. No, but it's, I think of it as like you know I was a carpenter. We used to hammer nails, and it's like you didn't put in. A ton of studs right now. It's like, oh, more studs. Right. It's, like, it's like the cowbell sketch. You know? More cowbell. I got a fever. <laughs> and the only it. cure is more nails. <laughs> well, like, well, well, do you guys know that like the automatic staplers that they use for doing like webbing for blown in insulation? They're like fully automatic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a while ago on Instagram, I saw some people that had gotten a hold of one of those and they were installing their WRB on the outside of the house. And they're like, Whoa. well, if a couple of nails is good, then this thing is much better. And they're literally. Uh, Oh, Jesus. Brrr, like, there must was have been 80, wow. 80 nails and or 80 the, and it, staples and it was per a WRB. stud face. They weren't plastic caps, probably. Oh, God, no. I, I was, I was once <laughs> And doing they weren't a, going back and taping over them, either. But I was. I once did that? a weather bear inspection on an apartment building, 100 <laughs> units. They basically stapled the whole WRB up. Mm -hmm. And I said, you got to tape them because they were supposed to be caps. Yeah. They were on a lift with pieces of tape covering people, thousands of staples on this <laughs> building. <laughs> when, I, when I teach sessions like that and I tell people that it has to be a cap nail or staple or it has to be taped over, they, like, instantly you yeah. see the panic. Yeah. Panic. And it's the it truth. Was, you can't just use bare staples except for basic placement. Or we just stop using those. Mechanically attached WRBs. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's that. that? But, it, but, no, but, but honestly, I feel like, I'm, like, did you just throw it on the Did you just like start a new debate? Like, I don't know, there's a place for everything. There's, like, there's what? a lot of dumb things we do in this industry, and, and I apologize to those people who spend lots of who money promoting them. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Wow. Travis. Wait, I'm wait sorry. a second. Michael, 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 Michael I got to call you on this. It's Hold all on. the workmanship. We but, do. But, but they're no, 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 no. It's all the workmanship. We do spray rack testing on windows on yep. everything. House rep tends to work the best, oddly enough, because they don't do a good job rolling the tape on zip. They do a yeah. better job. I the, believe the, the installers so do a better easy. job well, on the house rep. So I, I know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying. <laughs> it but, is but I'm telling so you, easy. it's 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 a hundred percent the way. It's always, not the product. I will always take a mechanical flap over a head flashing of a penetration that yeah. I will over it's, a poorly installed I, tape. I, I, I love sure. zip, but in terms Same. in the field, I, in the field, house rep tends to be done better. In, in general, I mean, they can do a terrible job on it, but it's 100% the workmanship. It is not the product. Even with the 50,000 staple holes. Well, that one, no. <laughs> I've, never, I, I've seen cap staples on Walt install of Tyvek, and maybe that's the only one. I, yeah. I mean, so yes, I mean, everything, it's workmanship. But also, if we said sample size, every house built in this one year period, zip would account for what? A, a, not a percent, a maybe. I have no idea. They're barely yeah. visible, like when we think about it on this scale. Yeah. So then, when we say, "Oh well, how many failures? How many imp poorly installed things are there?" Right. Well, of all of these, arguably maybe eighty percent of them, ninety percent of them aren't installed very well. Right. Self-adhered, fluid applied. I mean, there are <clears throat> other you solutions. You can screw up all of those. It's infinitely harder. It, it just becomes that much harder to screw up, I would argue. You know, there's no air that's flying behind that paper. It's not fluttering in the yeah. wind and trying to wiggle Unless itself Unless you off. let your old guys do it who are only putting a little bit of pressure and a little bit of pressure yeah, here and pressure. there. Yeah. Need more pressure. Under pressure. And with that, I, I think we're, we're right. out of time right, right now. Time. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, everybody, thank you for sticking with us. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks. Joe, thanks for uh, harassing us. Thank you. And uh, see you next time. Um, this is BS and Beer. It always goes exactly the way it was supposed to go. <laughs> That's right.